Okay, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to start in verse 18 this morning with a message I have entitled, How We Should See Our Present World. Now you hear me all the time talking about a biblical worldview. And I strive very, uh, very hard to keep that into perspective. I'm a human being, uh, just like you are, and so sometimes I will hear something on the news that's disturbing to me. Sometimes I will hear something on the news that will frustrate or aggravate me, and, uh, and I have to check my attitude and uh, remind myself that God is in control of every circumstance and that I am not at the mercy or the whim of decisions made um, in, in the political realm. I'm not at the, in, at the mercy or, or um, at, the, at the whim of uh, decisions that are made um, in our media or in our culture. Let me remind you this morning, folks, God intended for you and me to be countercultural. You're supposed to be different than the world around you. That's the way God designed it. You're supposed to stand out. And so our human nature, we are creatures that love to be accepted. We love to fit in. We don't want to be, when, I, you know, when you're in school, you didn't want to be the last one picked to play ball. You didn't want to be the one that sat in the corner by themselves. You want to belong. You want to be part of the group. That's part of our human nature. But as Christians, the group that we're supposed to be part of has changed. Now, the Bible says we're in the world, but not of the world. And we're not isolationists, and we don't believe that we ought to live in a monastery and sequester ourselves only among Christians. God has made us salt and light in the world in which we live, and therefore we have a mission, we have a purpose. We are the ambassadors of Christ. But we must remember and never forget that we have, or, or, or that we're to have a different outlook on the world than the world does. And so I, me personally, I've shared with you before, what I have to do is take the news in small doses. And folks, here's, I'm gonna give you a news flash this morning. Everything you hear on the news is not news. It is not news. We get a whole lot of opinion that is mask or, or masquerading as news. Uh, if there's a tornado, we had prayer requests for Cherubil last week. We were in Cherubil this week. My wife and I drove over there and saw the trees that have fallen down on some buildings and in yards in that area. That's news. Um, but some things that we hear are not. But visit with us this morning. We're going to share just a few minutes with you um, a few verses from the Scripture. And the first one is verse 18. It says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Now, I've entitled this section Biblical Bookkeeping. And you have a handout this morning. I'm not promising to do that every Sunday morning, but I did this Sunday morning. And, uh, and some of you have asked, why don't we have one on Sunday morning like we do on Sunday night and Wednesday night? Well, it's just a time issue, but I'll, I'll try to be better in that regard. But you got one this morning. And the reason I use this one called it biblical bookkeeping, the King James Version used says, not for I consider, but I reckon. And that, that word in the original language literally means it's an accounting word. I have looked at the two and I have compared the two. And, and that's what Paul is saying to us. He says, I, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which we shall be revealed. Now, there are different, differing degrees of suffering that, encounter, that we encounter in our life. And all of us suffer some at some point in our lives. And some of us suffer more than others do. But I want to give you a little context for this. So, I said Paul's was an informed calculation, but let's look at Paul. He says... Um, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. He's talking about being whipped. In prison more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In the journeys often in perils of the water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. So if you think that you're having a bad day or a bad week, I encourage you to go over to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 11 and reflect upon uh, what the, the person who penned most of our New Testament shared that he went through. And I would challenge most of us don't have any suffering that compares to what Paul went through. But Paul, having gone through all of these things, could still say that the suffering that he had experienced personally had no comparison to what lie on the other side of eternity. And that is part of a, a biblical accounting, if you will, a biblical bookkeeping. He's weighed the two and he said, yes, it's bad. Yes, I've gone through some difficult times, but I'm looking forward to my home in glory. And what I've gone through on this side of eternity has no comparison to what I'm going to experience in heaven. And that's good news, folks. I look forward to it. There's some days when you don't want to get up on this side of eternity, aren't there? There's some days when the world rushes in on you and, and, and the situations and the circumstances of life seem so big and you don't know how you're going to get over them. But God reminds us that this is not our home. We are sojourners, is the word the King James uses. We're traveling through this world on our way to another. If you remember that, it'll give you a lot of hope. So, an inevitable circumstance, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. And so again, an inevitable circumstance is that everybody suffers. If you, think, if you think there's anybody in this room today that has never suffered, you j- just stop and ask people. People will tell you about the difficulties in their life. All of us have gone through hardships. And young people, you, you may not have experienced the difficulties of life yet, but if the Lord tarries and you live your lives, difficult things will come your way, heartbreak, disappointment, financial struggles, relationship issues, emotional issues. Uh, (laughs) The money runs out before the bills do. All kinds of things come our way through life. Things that make us homesick the older we get and make us think about our homes in heaven more and make us look. Listen, I've told you before, I'm I'm a cup half half full person and I enjoy life. And I think, I think God blessed me in that regard. We were at a concert with the Martins last night, and one of the sisters there testified about her difficulty with depression. And I told Laura on the way home, I, I, I thank God that I don't wrestle with that particular difficulty in my life. I, I, don't, I can't even fathom what that's like. A bad day for me is maybe I got up at 6 o'clock instead of 4.30. I, 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 I don't have those kind of days and I'm, I tend to be optimistic. And that's a gift of God, I'm sure. Because the person who experiences depression, that's not a choice that they made. And so I thank God for that. But suffering is inevitable in this life. And so it, we rejoice that this life is not all that we have. Aren't you glad that this isn't the end? <laughs> I tell you what, I'm, I'm particularly glad the older I get. But I've been glad for a long time. Jesus changes our life and places joy inside of us. So we've got an informed calculation, inevitable circumstance, and an immeasurable conclusion. The Bible says that we don't have any idea, that our eyes can't imagine what heaven's going to be like. And so paint your best picture of heaven, and it'll be wrong. It will be incomplete because we can't imagine what God has in store for us. Now, this is not an invitation to rush our lives through. God has a purpose. Paul himself said that he, that he wrestled with this. He, he said, I, I, I'd like to be present with the Lord. To die is to be present with the Lord. He said, but look, God's got a purpose for me here. 
to die is gain. But I, he's got something he wants for me to do. And God's got something he wants for you to do this morning as well. God has a purpose for you. And folks, you've heard me say this before. A lot of times the suffering that you go through, as, especially as a believer, is the school of God in your life. Because God is gonna and God is gonna put you before somebody down the road who's facing those same difficulties. And God is going to have equipped you, He's gonna have tutored and trained you for that encounter down the road with that other person. So you can be an encouragement to them, so that you can lift them up, so that you can share with them how God helped you through that difficult hour. All right. I said this is a biblical worldview. He said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. I, I don't know what people think that, that, all right, this is all I got. I'm going to live this life and then I'm going to die. That's one of the reasons people live such reckless lives. It's because they have no hope in eternity. And you and I as born again believers have a hope in eternity. We know that we have a home. If I go, I, I come again to receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. God's coming again. He says in Revelations, even so, pray, come quickly. And so God is coming again, and that, that's our hope. And I tell you what, when God comes, it's going to be a good thing. It's going to be a great thing. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. All right, let's look at another one. Biblical evolution. I don't believe in scientific evolution, by the way. I don't believe I descended from a tree or slithered up on the beach. I've told you before, if that were true, we would have things slithering up on the beach every day. You say, no, it took millions of years. Well, millions of years have passed according to your own science. And so if in millions of years something slithered up, there ought to be something slithering up every other day. But it's not happening that way. And in fact, the Bible, which I believe is the divine inspired word of God, says there's nothing new under the sun. Now, some things have gone, haven't they? We know some things are extinct. They're not here anymore. But there's not anything new. Now, we might blend some things together, and I have a golden doodle. That's a poodle doodle something or another, but uh, we did that. We did that. That's, but there's nothing new under the sun. God created everything. So I'm not waiting for other things. So, biblical evolution, verse 19, for the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons. I've told you I don't believe in global warming. Uh, I, I've shared with you before, we look at things, if, if I take their science and say the world is 14 billion years old, and we've been observing the weather for, let's, I'll be gracious and say 300 years, and that's very gracious, by the way. Well, you do the ratio on 300 to 14 billion, and that's less than the blink of an eye. And if you can scientifically say, in the blink of an eye, you know what the weather's going to do in the next thousand years, you're... You're pretty, <laughs> you got more faith than I do. That's foolishness. That's fearfulness. That is a denial of the divine. That is, a, that is a searching for an answer other than one that calls upon you to make your life and your heart right with God. If we make our life and our heart right with God and we embrace God's word, it gives us peace and comfort. So let's look at biblical evolution. I've got a few things here I just want to share with you. Creation's awareness. I believe that creation is aware. The Bible says, for the earnest expectation of, of creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. So our world, and the Bible, by the way, says it's going to wax worse and worse like an old garment. And so that's what's happening, by the way. That's, that's a progressive thing. And, and I'll tell you this again, this is science for you. In science, nothing left to its own gets better. Nothing left to its own gets better. It decays and corrodes. Only in the theory of evolution do things left to their own recognizance get better. And so that very theory defies science. But we, the Bible tells us that creation is waiting for the coming of the Lord. The crea we don't know what the creation knows. You don't know what your dog knows. I shared with our Sunday school class this morning. My dog don't know much. He's, pretty, he's not the sharpest tool in the drawer. But uh, I, you don't know what animals comprehend. They may have a, a knowledge or an understanding of the divine that you and I don't possess. They're not, they don't have souls as far as we know. But they're a part of creation. 
And God says that creation is, is an earnest expectation. Create eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons. Why? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. So creation's got an awareness. Creation has an anticipation. Uh, <laughs> I told you there's a new heaven coming. We'll talk about that. But, but creation's in, and then creation's apex. Let me share that one with you. Here it is. This is uh, Isaiah 11, 6 and 9. It's talking about the millennial reign. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hey, that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed in God's plan. So I'm not, I'm not worried about the ice cubes in my glass melting and the water overflowing. I'm not worried about any of the, the, the pseudoscience that my world gives me to explain away the difficulties of this world. We, God has a plan for this planet. And we are on schedule for God's plan for this planet. And God's going to do great things on His time schedule and in His place. But this scripture tells us that the very creation of God is, is groaning and anticipating God's change in the world. Don't you look forward to the time when the lion's going to graze with the ox and, and hey, I don't like snakes, by the way. But think about a child put his hand in the den of a viper. Oh, you know, you're talking about divine intervention in the world. You're talking, about, you're talking about God taking us back to a Garden of the Eden situation. Sin corrupted the original world, and God is going to put it back. But he's not going to do it with science as we understand it. He's going to do it with his divine power. All right, let's look at biblical ecology. We've, we've covered the counting and evolution. Now let's look at ecology. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, who subjected it in hope. So the creation, that's the world that we live in. That's everything that's in the world. By, and, and, and who created everything? The Bible says everything that is and ever was was created by Jesus Christ, by the Word. And anything that was created was created by Him. And so uh, if we know that. We know that sin corrupted God's plan for creation. In uh, Genesis 1, 31, first part of that verse says that God saw everything that He made, and indeed it was very good. So God didn't mess up. I've often wondered about a toothache. Toothache's the most miserable thing for me, by the way. I do not like toothaches, and I go to the dentist frequently uh, to prevent having toothaches. Um, and, and, but I wonder, God, why? Why do I have to have a toothache? Um, sin wasn't God's original plan for, for us to hurt and fall apart and decay. But God created it all, and it was good. And the verse from Isaiah says he's going to do it again. He's going to do it again, and I look forward to that. But God didn't mess up. Sin corrupted the world that we live in. Let me make sure I didn't miss one. There you go. Sometimes my slide presentation. All right, here's up. In Genesis 3, 18, 19, this is the post-sin condition. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, Genesis 3, 18 through 19. And so sin changed the plan. Hey, can you imagine? Uh, I live on a farm, and I have to mow. And if I, don't, if I don't mow, things that I don't want there come up. I don't have to plant them, by the way. They just come up. Thistles come up. Thistles are of the devil. They, they are not good. No, nope, they're, they're pretty, but they're not good. And you have to pull them up by the roots. But they're a product of man turning away from God's plan for them. And so sin corrupted God's plan. God created something that was good, and sin changed it. And so sin corrupted it, and also <clears throat> sin co-opted it. He said, not willingly. The world 
The world didn't willingly change. We co-opted God's plan for the world. And we continue to do that, by the way. We continue to do that, by the way. We, and, and, and the last one of this is sin continues. And, uh, and, and that's because, listen, I, I'm, I'm uh, probably more environmentally conscious than most people that I know. I worked for nearly 40 years in the oil and gas industry, and I have been involved in um, environmental mitigations um, to all over the country. And we've done air, air uh, uh, testing and, and uh, we've done all kinds of, of, of studies and paid um, literally millions of dollars to ensure that what we did did not adversely impact the environment. But there's a man is tearing up what God has created. And so I share that with you. Listen, it's not just because we have a biblical worldview and we know that God's going to make it right, that doesn't mean we act foolishly. That doesn't mean you pour your oil out on the ground when you change your, your which is what we used to do, by the way, when we change our oil in our cars, we just go back in and pour that off. That, those are things that we've learned are destructive of the world. But folks, we're the ones messing up God's plan. We've continued to co-op God's plan for creation. The sin within us is what corrupts the world that we live in. Now, again, some of those things, the thorns and the thistles that came up, that was, those things were, were can you imagine the farmers? I don't know where morning glories fit in that, but that's another, that's another issue. And how about kudzu? There's one for you. But anyway, all of these things have their place. But if you have a biblical worldview, you know God's in control of things. I'm not worried about us polluting the world away. That's my point. I believe that God's time schedule, that, that, that we will, that God will restore the world. But I'm not surprised that we continue to, do, to go against God's plan for the world. I'm not surprised. And folks, I live in America, and you do too. Come with me to some of these other countries, and you'll see they're not nearly as mindful about the environment that we have as we are and as our legal system is. But folks, we, <laughs> this world... It's not going to get better because we quit using Freon. It, this world is not going get, to get better because you took your oil to advance auto instead of pouring it in a barrel in the backyard. This world's going to get better because God's going to change this world. And our sinful nature is going to continue to corrupt it. All right, biblical remediation. When we mess something up in the oil and gas industry, we, uh, we remediate. And uh, federal properties, if we cross a federal property, one of the things that we, is, is, is typical, they have a three-to-one remediation. So if we impact one acre, they'll say, well, you've got to give us three. And so I've been involved. So remediation is, is, is your stopgap, your, 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 uh, uh, your remedy for the damage that you've done. So in verse 21 and 22, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Oh, boy. Um, creation's got a whole lot. Different. So here's, here's the way creation is described in these verses. The present earth is said to be suffering. King James says in vain instead of futility. Futile in bondage and corrupted. That's the result of sin. That's where we are in our world today. And so when you turn on the news, this is what you should expect to see. Suffering, futility, bondage, and corruption. Am I surprised that we have corrupt politicians? Not at all. Uh, I'm surprised that we think we don't. Uh, because if, they, if, if, you know, if, if, if we don't turn to God... We're turning to self, and self is going to always take us down the wrong road. And just saying that, uh, that, that you're praying for somebody doesn't mean anything about your profession of faith. Your profession of faith is reflected in how you live. I've told you before, if, there, <laughs> if there's no sanctification, there's been no regeneration. God changes us, folks. God changes as He makes us different. And so this is the present earth that we live in. 
This is the new earth. God says, then I saw uh, in Revelation 21, 1a, John the Revelator, then I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth, the first earth had passed away. So this world, where is it going? It's going to, I've already told you, it's going to get worse and worse. That's what the Bible says. It's going to wax old like a garment. Politics isn't going to make it better. Environmentalists aren't going to make it better. Anthropologists aren't going to make it better. Talking heads on the media aren't going to make it better. It's going to get worse and worse, and then one day, God's going to step in and make it better. We're going to have a new earth, and I rejoice in that. I don't know what that. I don't know what that's going to look like. It goes on to say the sea's going to pass away. So there's going to be a lot more land, by the way. But, but anyway, God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and I look forward to being there. All right, the present transition, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Creation is in bondage. Creation is in bondage to corruption. Who put it in bondage? We did. Through our sinful nature, Adam and Eve at the beginning put it in bondage to corruption. And, but it will move from that bondage to the glorious liberty of the children of God. That We talk about the millennial reign. Late, late, that's a transition that we're in. We're in birth pains is what it says. I don't know. I had four children. Now, I went in with Laura on the first two, and then I called it quits. Um, how many went through Lamaze training? Anybody been through Lamaze training? Bless your hearts. Um, we did that. It was popular when our children were being born. Uh, go through Lamaze training. And I went through that. And, um, and, and Laura, you know, bless her heart, she's, she's there trying to have natural childbirth. You know, we don't have polio naturally. Um, we take medicine for that. That's what I told her. I said, sweetheart, you know, they, they can help you out here. Better living through chemistry. <laughs> Uh, we can help you out here. So, but she wanted the natural childbirth on the first one. After 32 hours of labor, uh, she began to rethink that, that, uh, that policy. But, but anyway, childbirth is painful. It's painful. And, and that's what the world compares, that's what God compares the world to. We're going through childbirth. We're, we're experiencing the pains of, of childbirth. There's a new world coming. And this world is struggling through that to get there. All right, we're nearly done. Biblical anthropology, we're going to touch them all. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption from the body. And that just tells us that you and me, as believers, this is talking to believers here, the world doesn't experience this, but you and me are experiencing anxiety in this life because we are foreigners here. We, this is not our home. We're traveling through. I've already told you, God says we're a peculiar people. We're a spectacle. We're different. We're supposed to be set, up, set apart. That's what sanctified means. And so he says our earnest is, is the Holy Spirit given to us to, to testify. The Bible says I, I, you've been sealed to the day of redemption. And God placed an earnest in your heart and your life. And that Holy Spirit within you is going to be against the world that you live in. It's going to cry out. It's going to cry out against what the world wants us to do. Then our, our exasperation says we ourselves groan within ourselves. I've told you already, sometimes I get aggravated. Sometimes I get frustrated. Hey, sometimes... I get frustrated with myself. Anybody been frustrated with yourself? The Bible says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, for him it is what? Sin. The Bible says, <laughs> so sometimes I get frustrated with myself. Paul said, that that I would do, I do not. And that that I would not do, that I do. And he testified to the battle that goes on within our flesh. And it's not condoning sin, but it's reminding us that we're in a spiritual warfare. The Sunday school lesson this morning talked about spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians chapter 6, that we're, we're battling against spiritual forces. And so we get, sometimes we get frustrated, we get exasperated with the circumstances of life. And, and God says that the, the first fruits of the Spirit have been given to us, the earnest, to help us 
to understand. To, to, you, do you realize that when you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you got new sight? God gave you a new vision for the world. God gave you a new outlook. And if you don't have a new outlook, you need to check yourself because God does that for all of us. He gives us a new perspective. And then our expectation. Uh, I told you, Revelation says, even so, come quickly. We ought to be expecting God. We ought to be living an expectant life. Now, I know, young folks, that's harder on you than it is us older folks because we've experienced more of the hardships. We've experienced more of the difficulties of life. Home's closer for us. We're getting a, we can see it just down the edge of the road, just over the next horizon. We can see it. And so we're, we're expecting. We've got friends already over there that we're looking forward to meeting. You're young, and that's way off in the future for you, you hope. But we ought to live in expectation. All right. Biblical retirement planning. <laughs> I know that's not science. This is our last verse. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Well, that makes good sense, doesn't it? If you can see it, it's not hope. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can't see them. The evidence of things not seen. It's your, it's your hope. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Uh, so let's look at this. The hope of Christ is the first thing. Folks, if... if, if our hope is in Christ. We, we shared that scripture with you at the beginning. If, if our hope in Christ is on this present side of, of eternity, Paul said we are above all men most pitiable. We are living for Christ to come and change things. We are trying to get back to the perfect model that God planned for us. And we all fall short on this side of eternity. But our hope is in Christ. Our strength is in Christ. Our righteousness is in Christ. Everything that we have is in our faith and understanding of Jesus Christ. Now, I can't see Jesus. And you can't see Jesus. But I believe in Jesus with all my heart. And I believe he's coming again. And I'm praying that it will be soon. And I tell you, folks, it, it's, sooner than, it, it's sooner than it's ever been right now. And tomorrow it'll be even sooner. So we have the hope of Christ, and then we have the hope in Christ. John 14, 2 and 3, in my Father's house, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. That's our hope in Christ. Christ is about the business of preparing a place for you and me. Boy, <laughs> I can't imagine, and you can't either. But if he spoke the world into existence in six days, what can heaven be like? Because he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's a process. And I will come again. So my hope is in Jesus Christ. My hope is not in, 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 in the Democrats or the Republicans. My hope is not, ultimately, there's going to be a one-world ruler over this world. My hope's not in that. My hope's not in a utopic society where we're all recycled. My hope's not in any of those things. My hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And it's all right. The hope that continues. For we, re for we were saved in this hope, but the hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. The word perseverance is, is, um, is endurance. It, it, it means that you stick with it to the end. Now, the, the Bible says, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, our our uh, our brothers and sisters who believe you can lose your salvation, and I'm not one of those, uh, will say, that's the scripture right there. He that endureth to the end, same shall be saved. And I say, amen. Because that's the people who were saved, the ones who endured to the end. That's the earmark of salvation is that God walked you through it. Otherwise, you kept yourself. And I'll tell you many, many times, you can't keep yourself. 
If you think you can, just try it for a couple of days. Just try to be sinlessly perfect. I just, I'll, give, I'll let you off easy. Try to be sinlessly perfect this afternoon. Come back tonight and tell me how it went. Sinlessly perfect. I'll have some water set up out in the parking lot. You can walk across on your way in. <laughs> no, you're not going to do it, and neither am I. None of us are. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope, our hope continues. We persevere through the difficulties of life. We fall down and we get up again. It's what we do. I like that song. We were talking about last night. We singing the Martins. They don't sing it. I forget who sings it. But on my best day, I'm a child of God. And on my worst day, I'm a child of God. Every day, I'm a child of God. <laughs> and that is good news for me. And I rejoice in that. I think that's my last slide, God's invitation. It's not mine. But let me just encourage you this morning to do business with God. I don't know what you're struggling with. But I am confident this morning that all of us are wrestling with something. It may be medical, it may be emotional, it may be financial, I don't know. But God knows. Let me just encourage you to give it to God today. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then let today be the day you fix that. Ask God to come into your heart and life, forgive you of your sins, and be your Lord. And He says, I'll do that if you'll confess your sins and believe in your heart. He will, you will be saved. I'm going to ask our musicians to come and lead us in the invitation. And you be obedient to God. You can come forward. The altar is here. Always open. You can do business with God in the pew. I'll be happy to, to visit with you if I can help you in any way.